everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Untraditional Industries uh, with Arbeit, uh, where we talk about uh, the more untraditional stories of people that are involved in somewhat traditional industries. So thanks uh, so much for Emily and Greg for joining me today. Emily's a team member here with uh, Arbeit, uh, also joined by Greg Shoemaker with ARCA. So thanks so much, Greg, for joining us. Appreciate you coming on. No problem. Thanks for having me. Um, so, you know, I, we haven't done one of these episodes in a while. And uh, I these are my favorite. I honestly really love these. Um, they're, they're super cool to learn about um, different industries, stories behind them. Um, and yeah, it's just such, it's so interesting. The different types of companies that are in Buffalo, the different types of things that people are doing and some things that you don't even think about are industries. So, and I think one of yours, your industry is one of those things people might be fat. And I think I'm going to be super excited to learn about, but um, so if you could give us a little bit background um, on yourself and you know, your company. Yeah, definitely. So background on myself, a uh, serial entrepreneur for the last five or six years, uh, got into business kind of on accident. You know, I was 23 looking around, seeing everyone I knew going to college, getting jobs, doing things. And I kind of thought to myself, well, what am I going to do? So I got started really small, tried out a bunch of different businesses on my way to where I am today. We did everything from cleaning products that we invented, women's clothing, toys, furniture, import, export, and finally landed in this reverse logistics space, which in one sense is very untraditional, but it's also directly embedded into almost everything that we deal with. And I think talking about it is going to be a great fit for this podcast. Awesome. Thanks. Cool. So I can't wait to hear more about it. <laughs> yeah, we're really excited to hear about it. So can you start off just telling us what problem you were looking to solve with your business and maybe how you figured out that that problem even existed? Yeah, definitely. So I think um, first, it's really important to understand the way the supply chain flows in forward and reverse to understand the problem that we solve. So everybody is familiar with forward supply chain. I mean, everything from an idea to R&D, manufacturing, distribution, retail, everybody's familiar with that supply chain, right? Well, when a product is past its useful life cycle and needs to have a sustainable disposition realized, what people sometimes don't know is that there is an equally long process with those steps moving backwards in order to get that product the sustainable disposition that it needs. So Typically, when these companies are facing these material challenges, they face the same problems over and over again. It's a very fragmented industry. There's thousands of different places they can go to solve little bits and pieces of their problem. Um, up until we came around, there really wasn't a full-blown encompassing solution that they could defragment or bundle all of the different best parts of the industry. And I'm happy to, I'm happy to explain a little bit more. I just don't want to ramble for you guys, you know? Yeah. Could you, you know, on that, could you explain like a, maybe like a use case, give us one example of like how the process works um, with you, you know, how you guys and one of your customers maybe interact and what that's like. So people watching can get an idea of what the company does. Yeah, definitely. So let's take a manufacturer, for instance, and this, this exact challenge can take place in almost any manufacturer. That manufacturing facility is going to have manufacturing equipment. They're going to have other assets such as the products they manufacture. They're going to have spares that are used in repairing the equipment that they use to manufacture said product. So let's say they reach a point. And typically the companies that we're dealing with are not going out of business. What they're doing is they are purging extra or excess assets from their existing operating system. When, when this company defines either their equipment or their inventory as obsolete, they have a couple options. They can go directly to a recycler and basically receive no type of compensation to have their items recycled. They can go to a liquidator and part with their items at a liquidation price. They can go to an auctioneer and kind of close their eyes and let the gavel drop on whatever price this stuff sells for. Or they can choose to internally manage that whole process and they can set up those downstream relationships with 
sometimes up to hundreds of different dealers that specialize in each individual part of their surplus. So there'll be one guy that does the conveyor belts and another company that does the motor operators and another company that does some of the MRO spares and a business that does the electrical. Typically, each of those businesses that they are going to manage and sell to in a you know, secondhand market fashion, they're not equipped to handle that company's whole problem. The guy that does the motor controls often does not do the conveyor belts. And having a solution like us, where we sit in between buyer and seller, we're able to take the entire problem off of both of their plates. So for the manufacturer, we are taking the problem off their dock into our facility. It is now our problem. And for the buyer, what's happening is because of their niche down nature of their business, they're not optimized to solve the problem for the manufacturer. So by us taking it into our dock, we are in fact solving the problems for both ends of the spectrum. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, completely. Wow. That, yeah, that makes complete sense. That's awesome. Um, when start, you, you mentioned you started a ton you had different things, started a ton of different companies. Um, when you were starting ARCA, what were some of the risks that you considered going into this business? Um, and, and what are some of your, maybe if there are those risks the same now, have they changed? So the risks very early on, like, you know, quarter one of year one are a lot different than what they were today. Back then, you know, taking on our first loads of equipment and taking on our first projects, not coming from that industry and not having a background in those industries was a huge risk. You know, here we are, we're going to accept 25 truckloads worth of spare industrial components. And we're hoping that there's a market on the other side for these products. The risks that we face today, though, are much different. The risks that we're encountering today are more in line with scalability, predictive planning or strategic planning, where to deploy capital, what markets to take risks on, you know, the ever the ever present challenge of whether we continue to develop our own software or use something out of the box. So as the business has evolved from, you know, its very early baby stages, our challenges have become much more sophisticated and so have the risks. Cool. So you mentioned that you're a serial entrepreneur. So I'm kind of curious to hear your answer to this next question. Um, how do you personally define success? And then maybe how would you define success for ARCA specifically? So for me to go down and explain every last little goal that we have, every milestone that we have, we'd be here all day. But in terms of ARCA success, it is going to be the accuracy in which we achieve or exceed our goals that we are setting. And those goals can be everything from a expected return recovery value to the size of our team, our square footage, our SKUs under management at any one given point in time. How close we come to those goals is how we are going to define our success. And I think that that definition also boils down into how we define success, but there's there's really a second part to that. Something that I really like to do personally is I like to measure the ripple effect that I have. And regardless of what type of revenue ARC is doing or what type of facility we're in or how many team members we have, it's less quantitative and more qualitative. You know, what we want to see is people's lives improving. We really do embody this give first mentality. We're always willing to help teach, help people grow before the curve. You know, this is not a reactionary thing. And for us, being able to see, track, and measure the improvements in people's lives through the ripple effect that we have is really how I personally define it. It's, that's awesome because I know that you um, really embody that just from obviously knowing you personally uh, this year, you know, Greg is wants other people to succeed. And if you see him on LinkedIn and um, the things that he's doing, whether it's charitable or just bolstering other people, you know, I shared my cousin's uh, apparel brand that she just started on LinkedIn and Greg bought two hoodies right away. So um, a lot of people don't do that type of stuff. And uh, in the, 
in the in the startup space you know they they say they do but they don't actually right um and like what's what's better than actually supporting a business than giving them your cash and buying their product <laughs> so i appreciate that for sure and you know he really does do what he says he does here so um but to go on a little bit further um on your challenges you kind of mentioned this um uh when we talked about risks but so today with arca like what what's your biggest challenge if there was something that you could say is the biggest challenge for your company, uh, what would that be? The biggest challenge I think that we face is not always obvious that it takes like a little bit of self inquiry to even be able to realize, um, not just myself, but everybody in the organization is entrepreneurial at heart, whether people have had other businesses or they still have other businesses or they have plans for another business, we are all of a very similar persona where we just want to get things done. Uh, sometimes the desire to get things done will pile lots and lots of stuff onto our plate. And for a long time, we were often yes men or yes women, yes, yes people, right? Constantly bringing new opportunities in the door. And for us, one of the biggest challenges is not doing the next big, cool, shiny thing and focusing on what it is that we plan to implement. So growing in a sustainable way where it's not just rapid fire, get overwhelmed, bring in everything under the sun, experiment in a hundred different industries, being able to kind of streamline our efforts towards what we think is going to be the best and then stick to those is probably probably the biggest challenge. I mean, as, as you know, we're a young team full of young people and a young company. And that obviously provides a great deal of benefit. I mean, we're agile, we're flexible, we're looking at problems in a completely different way than the rest of the industry is, but there's also inherent downsides of that. You know, none of us have ever been there, done this before in certain through certain lenses. There's things that we have to learn every day. And of course, all of these new opportunities, they sound amazing but it takes the self-discipline and control to right-size that growth in, according, in accordance with our projections instead of just having this whirlwind of new opportunity. Yeah, I can definitely empathize with that. I call, I call it shiny object syndrome here. Like when I just see something, I want to do it. I mean, you started so many things, so it's like being that entrepreneurial spirit. Like I'm, you know, it's right. You always want to start new things. So I can imagine that's, um, that's a difficult and that's it's super important though to remain focused. So, yeah. Um, and so the next question is kind of similar, but were there any mistakes you can recall at the beginning of your business or anywhere along the way that stood out to you that you learned something from? Yeah, there's, uh, there's definitely been mistakes. And I mean, to kind of tie it back into the last question, some of, some of the mistakes that we encountered and none of them were really that big a deal, but there were definitely areas in which we lost traction and lost momentum because of shiny object syndrome. Um, understanding what it is that you're good at and having the discipline to stick there kind of helps you avoid some of that stuff. There was, there was a point in time where the next big shiny thing was retail liquidation. And, uh, you know, retail liquidations in today's day and age are a dime a dozen. There's like four or five big companies. Some of them are startups. Some of them are established that are all competing in that retail liquidation space. And what was really interesting is that at the beginning of COVID, all these people find themselves out of work. And what you started to witness were all of these little mom and pop retail operations popping up where their entire business model was to go on the internet, you know, purchase a truckload of who knows what, liquidated retail items, bring them in, pick through it, offer those items to sale or for sale to the general public. And for us to get in that space, it seemed very, very attractive. You know, in our business, either way, at the end of the day, a truckload of who knows what is showing up at the dock. It's a lot easier to identify a Dyson vacuum or a microwave than it is to identify and price, say, a contactor or a reversing starter, or, you know, semiconductor equipment. So for us to take a gander at the retail liquidations was very attractive. But when you boil it down, that's not really 
where we drive value. The companies that we work with are not major retailers, they're manufacturers. And at the end of the day, the challenges are very similar. But I would say going even down that road a little bit was probably one of our bigger mistakes. If we would have taken that three, four months and we would have focused it on some of the things, say, that we're working on today, we could be that many more steps ahead of even where we are. Have you guys seen that? Have you guys seen that big uptick in retail liquidation businesses? Um, I, I mean, I could... It makes sense. It. Uh, I don't know if I've seen it per se, but it definitely, I mean, you got a lot of companies that are closing, right, from the pandemic. And just even before that retail, I mean, retail's dead, right? Like everyone says that, you hear that all the time. So I could, yeah, for sure, that makes complete sense um, that, that, that you'd see an uptick in it and why you would want to like get in that area. Um, so, um, so on that, uh, talking about customers in the different industries that you're in, you're saying manufacturing is right. That's where most of your customers are. Um, how are they, I mean, how are they finding you? Um, is it, you're not just going to Wegmans and buying ARCA off the shelf. So how are they, uh, <laughs> how are they finding you guys? Definitely. So it's important to understand that we're a very two-sided market. On one side, we have the clients in which we are servicing. You know, those are your large companies, your manufacturers, and then downstream from that, who we are selling to are our customers. So when it comes to clients, uh, we are bringing in clients with a brand new, freshly updated website. We have spent a lot of time building our SEO, blogging, doing white papers, answering questions that these people may be typing into Google, you know, something that we find a lot with our clients is that, you know, it's not the CEO of this large company that's dealing with the liquidations. It's someone a few rungs down in purchasing or in MRO, CapEx, you know, wherever they are in the organization and they get tasked with the liquidations for the company. Chances are they didn't go to college for liquidations. They didn't go through a crash course in their onboarding on liquidations. So oftentimes they're going to type right into Google, liquidators near me, or how to liquidate X product, how to sell X type of product. And uh, we've been able to get a lot of good inbound from that on our site. Now, in terms of our downstream channels, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the manufacturer may be sending us a hundred different product types of assets. When we go and we find our customers, we're going to segment that list of a hundred into much smaller, easier to manage groups that make sense for that industry. And then we're going to call on these people. Now we do get calls inbound as well, but usually the customers that we're going after are very targeted. They are targeted because they meet certain criteria, they uphold certain standards, they, their brand carries a certain weight inside of their industry. And to us, they've been identified as a premier partner to be able to sell these goods back into the market. So for us going outbound to the customers, we figure out exactly who we wanna go after and we call them and we simply ask, hey, do you wanna join our exclusive club? And, you know, at first people are a little confused, but as soon as they understand what we're all about and what our value proposition is, it clicks and we just work on building those relationships, servicing that's, those relationships. That's the best cold call line I've heard. I, I, I want to hear, I want someone to cold call me and say that I would stay on the line. <laughs> I don't know if we've ever actually said that verbatim to somebody. You got to try that, it. That, that's the, <laughs> that's the, the spirit of it. You know? Yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> So the last question we have for you is if you could give one piece of advice to an aspiring business owner, what would it be? So this has been, this has been relevant a lot lately in some of the other work and some of the other stuff that I'm involved in, but if you're going to get into business and you're going to start business, don't play business. When you have an idea for a company, or for a business. You do not need to go and create a logo, get a domain, make fancy t-shirts, build this beautiful website, copyright your idea. You don't need to do any of that until your idea is validated. And you can validate nearly any business idea 
for free or for extraordinarily cheap. And until you have validated that idea through several iterations, there is no reason that you should be talking about names, copyrights, business cards, websites, domains. None of, none of that stuff matters. Because when you're testing it, the very first people you're going to test with are your friends and family. You're going to turn to your friend next to you and say, this is my idea. What do you think of it? They give you praise. Version one is validated. Now you take it to a stranger. Version two is validated. Then maybe you take it online or you take it to a trade show. You take it to where you can get more eyes in front of it. You are steps and steps and steps away from needing an actual logo, needing to protect any IP, needing to do any of that. So what we to tie it full circle, when people go and do that and they preemptively create all this stuff, we call that playing business, which is fun. Don't get me wrong. There's nothing more fun than designing a new logo, picking a name, shopping for a domain. Oh, is the .com available or am I going to have to go IO? That is fun, but you don't need to waste your time doing that until the idea is actually validated. I, that is such, I, yeah, I, I love that advice. <laughs> it's so often that you see that happen. I never even thought of a word for that, but everybody starts there, right? Like I gotta have a logo yeah. and I can even like me, I, I mean, I, when I first started, I remember like you put this weight into these things that are not meaningful whatsoever. And uh, wow, that's, yeah, I like that advice a lot. So I, I remember my first, first business ever, I invented, I invented a product for cleaning cell phones, right? And I won did not validate it. Two, I didn't even know if the problem that I was solving, people actually cared about. So at this point in time, I think I had $12 like in total revenue for the whole company. And I was dumping any life savings that I had from being a waiter into a website, into talking to patent lawyers to like get the name trademarked. Turns out the whole you know, mantra of this product was that it sanitized cell phone and iPad screens. It's kind of gross. The phone screens are really dirty, but nobody actually cared. And when I finally took it to market, I can't even tell you how many people would hold up their cell phone in front of me and just lick the screen. They're like, I don't care how dirty it is. I don't need to buy your product. And I could have saved myself all that time, energy, and effort, even though I learned a lot in that process. Part of the learning was that I didn't need to do that just yet. Wonder if people would still do that in today's uh, environment. Maybe you got another venture start. You revisit that with uh, no with comment, COVID. No <laughs> so, uh, well, that's all we got for you here today. So, I really appreciate you coming on, Greg. I love these episodes. It was I always knew what your company was about and like what you guys did generally, but learning way more about it was was fun. So, I appreciate it. Um, and thanks for co-hosting them. Thank you guys so much. It was an honor. Yep, Thank thanks. You, and uh, thanks for everyone watching. We'll see you all next time. See you.